Seth DiStefano is our next guest. He is the Policy Outreach Director at the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. That is not a state office, by the way. It's a uh, private nonprofit organization. Seth, good morning. How are you, sir? Good, Rob. How are you all doing? Excellent. Thank you. Hey, uh, I was talking to Delegate Mike Hornby, who, of course, owns this radio and TV station thing here that we we do. (laughs) And uh, he was telling me that the news of that big fire in Charleston included your apartment. It did. That was my building, um, the Regal down here on Canal Boulevard last Wednesday afternoon, um, caught fire and um, subsequently pretty much burned to the ground. Uh, but everyone met, everyone was evacuated safely and there, there was no loss of life. So we're, uh, we're all very thankful for that. Well, like they say, you can always replace stuff, but you can't, can't replace life. But it does take some time and effort and money to replace stuff. So my sympathies to you, man. And I'm sure this has become a, part, a fairly stressful part of your, uh, your life right there. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the timing is not ideal for someone that, you know, does what I do. I just, this happening during the legislature wasn't the best. But, again, I mean, it's, it puts a lot of things in perspective, Rob, you know. Um, sure. You know, you can buy more. I can buy a new laptop, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I can find another apartment. All these other things seem a little bit more trivial. How many people were involved? How many people were displaced? <clears throat> so I think 35 um, out of the 37 units um, were, were occupied. Um, at the time, and the exact number, I think it was just under 50 folks of my neighbors and, and whatnot. Were, were, were you in the building as, when it burned, Seth, or were you at work? I was in the building. I'd come home for a little break, come home to make a sandwich, and uh, was just kind of relaxing a little bit before I, you know, took on the, um, you know, the second, the, the, the afternoon and evening part of my day during the legislature is dedicated to follow-ups, mm-hmm. right, kind of knock out the meetings in the mornings as, as much as you can and then you do the follow-ups in the afternoon and the evenings and i had a you know had a little something to eat and was uh believe it or not thinking about taking a nap of all things and i heard a bunch of commotion um out on canal boulevard and uh opened up the blinds and there were i don't know close to a dozen fire trucks and emergency response vehicles and they were rolling out the hose um in front of the, the apartment building so we so the- opened up the door to my the apartment and you could you could see the smoke in the hallway it was clear wow. The building was definitely on fire. So there were no internal fire alarms that you heard? No, not. Oh, that's that's alarming. Good thing you weren't yeah. sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, um, alarming and infuriating, both at the same time. Yeah. How old was so, the building, Seth? I'm not sure exactly how old the building was, but it, it had a good, I mean, it had a very loud fire alarm system, right, that had, you know, I've lived, I've lived there for seven years, and when that fire alarm goes off, you don't miss it. Right. You can you hear that one down the street. Like it's designed to pull you out of a dead sleep. Right. So I really don't know what happened there, um, but it definitely did not go off when it should have. No, sir. Well, uh, thoughts and prayers with you, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Absolutely. Hey, I was at, uh, we had Governor Justice on the program yesterday, and then mm-hmm. I attended his town hall meeting in Martinsburg yesterday afternoon. And there was a fair amount of pushback at that meeting, mainly by what appeared to me to be the retired community, against enacting the tax cut. And uh, the momentum from that group seemed to be more about, let's spend the money on things we know we need fixed in West Virginia, Seth, which made me think of you, because I think that's kind of more along the line where you are with this surplus. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, when we think about West Virginia's budget surplus in its entirety, um, you know, I think we can we can boil it down to, you know, three contributing factors. The first and the biggest is, you know, an, an, a global energy market that is very advantageous for West Virginia right now. You know, severance taxes from coal and especially natural gas um, have been going gangbusters. And so as of as of right now, that makes up over half of the fiscal year 2023 um, budget surplus projected nearly 900 million, possibly higher over the last two fiscal years um, in budget surplus. Uh, But as we all know, gas prices, coal prices um, fluctuate wildly. Not giving they just, they're all over the place. They're great for a while and then they bust, then they level out, then they go great for a while, then they bust. So it's not, it's not good to make long-term financial plans um, based strictly off severance tax revenue. It is good, however, um, to do things like fill potholes and pave roads and build water systems and take care of things that you know are, are one-time needs um, with money that is, is temporary in nature, if that makes sense. I think we've talked about that. Before. Indeed. 
Um, Go ahead. No, yeah, say like, you know, one of the other factors, um, you know, of the surplus in, in the impact on the budget is inflation itself, right? So as just as inflation impacts all of us, right, if I go, you know, the pair of shoes I go buy um, today, you know, two years ago was probably, you know, 40 or $50 cheaper, um, and a lot of that has to do with inflation. But the fact that they're more expensive now means West Virginia collects more sales tax off of that. Um, that is also a temporary phenomenon. That, that's not going to last forever, right? And so when we think about in, enacting permanent tax cuts to what that, that would, you know, $1.5 billion price tag, and that's, that's what Governor Justice's plan calls for, um, permanent reduction in revenue to West Virginia based off of very temporary circumstances. Um, you know, our analysis shows that things get, get pretty ugly pretty quick when it comes to the budget shortfalls and the cuts that would have to come after. Bill. Yeah. Uh, do you, you, you've made these points before, uh, but my sense is that this is a fait complete uh, with the, uh, with the legislators, the makeup of the legislators and they campaign on a tax cut. I think it's going to happen regardless. Uh, it's, it's, they've had a couple of uh, uh, bumps in the road, but I think those are more personality than anything else. So I think it's going to happen. Uh, do you have the same sense, regardless of the arguments that you make, that's going to happen regardless? I don't. I really don't. Um, you know, I was in, you know, I was doing a town hall in Parkersburg last night, um, and I think that you know, as, as Rob talked about, you know, we have seen and heard. Um, similar pushback um, from from different communities where the governor has gone to try and sell his personal income tax cut plan, and I think lawmakers are taking notice. Um, you know, especially when when older West Virginians, retirees who who vote in much higher percentages, right? We all know that um, speak up and say, "Listen, we don't. We need to take care of one-time things. We need to take care of unmet needs." I think the governor's hearing that everywhere he goes. Um, and so I think that lawmakers are clearly paying attention to that. And I think that the state Senate, um, you know, as they say, is the, the saucer that cools the tea, if you will, um, has, has publicly said they are not going to get in a rush over this. Right. And so, you know, we had the state of the state and the governor came out six guns a blazing um, with a you know, 50 percent personal income tax cut, you know, 30 percent starting this year, 10 percent um, over you know, a year for the next two years. Um, the House quickly. Um, jumped on that, took action, passed his bill out, sent it to the Senate. Um, there was, you know, a kerfuffle here and there. Um, but, you know, as of this week, I think that Senate leaders have, you know, been pretty clear um, that they are not going to get in a rush. Um, to his credit, um, Senate President, you know, Craig Blair has come out and said, everybody says they want this, but nobody is, is willing to come out and say what they're willing to go without. Um, and I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I don't always agree with Senate President Blair, uh, but he was right on the money with that one, right? If you're going to take one and a half billion dollars um, out of West Virginia's general revenue fund um, forever, um, you have a responsibility to say, listen, this is what we're going to have to go without in order to make that happen. And where do those cuts happen, and and how bad does it get? I think more folks in West Virginia, and I've seen this on the trail with Amendment Two. I saw this on, you know, just even last night up in Parkersburg. People want things that have not been addressed addressed right they want infrastructure needs taken care of you know potholes filled roads paved water systems updated you know broadband that that works for everybody um west virginians are just not interested as a people um i don't think we're really interested in trickle down tax cuts and that's really what a personal income tax cut is almost two-thirds of the governor's plan um benefits only the wealthiest 20 percent um, of households in the state. That is just not something that has a lot of public support in West Virginia. And there's a lot of time left. So, I mean, I, I think I think, you're, I think we're all going to be a little surprised when, when the dust settles. A lot of time left. We're talking about a month and a half. That's uh, And we we've, we've already have the House on board, the governor on board, and the and President Blair has uh, uh, he said a couple of so things. He said we want to go slow and we want to look at some of our, expen uh, our expenses. But he's also said if we could collapse the three years down to one year, he'd be very supportive of it. So to me, there's a lot of momentum that's already built. Uh, so I'm a little surprised. I'd be curious to see learn more how you think there'll be a pushback that will slow or stop this momentum. I mean, I think it's just, you know, the idea of competing plans, um, at some point, somebody's going to have to answer the question, um, how on earth do you pay for this, right? And then when it comes to quote-unquote tax cuts, that's where things get tricky, right? Um, do you pay for 
cure this by not addressing um, a shortfall in the public employee insurance agency, right? The uh, you know the um, you know the health care that supports state employees um, and retirees, right? Because you can't have it both ways. Um, do you pay for this uh, by massive cuts to higher education? One of the only places um, the legislature is really allowed to do any significant cutting is higher ed. Um, One and a half billion dollar cut to higher ed. You're not just talking about massive increases of tuition uh, for for students seeking a higher education. You're talking about wholesale colleges and universities across Western. But there'll be there'll be several that just won't survive that. And so, you know, at the end of the at the end of the day, I think that what people are kind of waking up to and the questions people are asking um, are, are kind of relating to, listen, a lot of a lot of what we're saying we're going to use to pay for this is very, very temporary money in nature, right? Severance tax dollars are not going to be around forever, right? This, these energy prices will come back down to earth. Inflation will level out. Um, and not just a couple of years ago, when we were looking at our budget, you know, six years out, we used to do a six-year plan, right? When the governor would submit his budget, he would also submit a six-year outlook as to what revenues would, would look like. The last time the governor submitted his six-year plan, um, it spelled trouble down the road. Um, and, and trouble down the road in just, you know, a year or two. Um, so, you know, I think that's on lawmakers' minds. And I just, I, if the, you know, Bob, I don't hear people out there, uh, I just don't hear people clamoring um, for tax cuts to benefit the wealthy. And I think West Virginians understand that that's what a personal income tax cut does. And so I just, you know, I, you know, I'm not just talking about my little bubble here in the east end of Charleston, um, as I like to call it, the Austin, Texas of West Virginia, right? I mean, I'm talking like, you know, you know having traveled all around West Virginia, um, you know, since since last July, you know, from southern West Virginia uh, to the Potomac Highlands to the northern Panhandle to the Ohio Valley, you know, two or three tours of duty out in your neck of the woods. Um, I, I can literally count on one hand um, when I, you know, with the thousands of people I met, um, I can count on one hand the people that said, you know, I'd like to have a personal income tax. I, I, I'm not hearing anybody out there talking. Putting the merits of it aside for a couple of minutes, looking strictly from the political aspect, uh, the the Republicans ran on this. They were elected. They have a supermajority. Uh, they have been campaigning since the session began that they're going to do a tax cut. Uh, and so the sense is that the Senate will go along with some version of the House, and the House said whatever modified, they'll come back to them. Putting the merits aside, how can you not believe that the momentum is moving so fast now it's going to happen regardless of whether it's the best thing to do or not? Well, I mean, I think that, I think the last time we, Bob, you and I, you and I had the, the discussion about a momentum, it was, I think it might have been my first or second time on the show um, when, when you insisted that we were going to lose on Amendment 2, right? And the momentum was just too strong, and there was just nothing we could do about it, and just might as well cash it in and throw in the towel. You know, that turned out different. Um, you know, while we, you know, may only have six weeks um, left of the legislature, six weeks, um, honestly, at the West Virginia State Legislature is like, it's like a lifetime. Um, and just when it comes to tax cuts, really, I mean, there's a difference between campaigning on you know, tax cuts or tax relief or whatever you want to call it, and then actually enacting policy. One of the things about tax policy that is very cool, if you ask me, um, is that you can actually design it to benefit exactly who you want it to benefit, right? And so what we're saying, and I think what the people of West Virginia are understanding, and I think it's starting to settle in um, with lawmakers to a degree, is that personal income tax are designed to benefit the wealthy, right? You don't have to do tax policy that way. You can act, you can absolutely design tax policy to benefit, for instance, families with children, right? Um, for instance, right now, um, West Virginia could take $750 million of this budget surplus that we have. Um, and then just at, on one time, um, they could send um, families with children who are 17 and under um, $2,000 per child, just like that. How, you know, like that is a real benefit. That is something the legislature has the power to do. That is something that they can specifically design policy to do with this money if they chose um, to prioritize families in that way. Uh, They can do it with, you know, people over 60 as well. Um, You know, so that there are things I think the legislature can do that that we have publicly come out and said, yes, we are supportive of. But when it comes to tax reform or tax policy, the big question is, who does it benefit? And the reason it's important to ask that question is because 
you can literally get into the state code and you can design tax policy to benefit exactly who you want it to benefit. And the problem is, is that everything we've seen so far down here in Charleston is it, it only really benefits the very, very wealthy and everybody else just basically gets crumbs, um, if, if anything at all. And then within two or three years, they're going to be they're, they're going to be the ones. The people who hardly received anything are going to be the ones who feel the brunt um, of a devastated state budget. Maria. So um, besides, Seth, besides the tax cut, what else are you hearing? You made reference to PEIA. Um, you know, clearly there are issues about that. Our local uh, legislators um, before the session certainly talked a lot about um, locality pay for um, not just teachers and service personnel, but jail personnel, so on and so forth. It, it, clearly that's going on too, although what's in the headlines are the, are the tax cuts. What about some of these other issues? Um, and as you so said, I, we have a lifetime. We have six weeks. So, yeah. No, I thank you for bringing this up. And I'm re- cause I, re- I was really hoping we would get to dive into um, some of the things that are happening down there that I think are kind of on a collision course with the governor's plan. And I think also um, kind of to Bob's point as well, and I, I didn't get to articulate this as well as I wanted to, um, tell me that the legislature um, is, is thinking kind of beyond tax cuts and, and other things. And this is um, so in the House of Delegates, I would, I would encourage your listeners to really pay attention to what's going on in the House when it comes to employee pay raises um, and, and spending money to address needs that have gone unaddressed for a while. So, for instance, this week, um, House Education Committee, um, I believe, voted out a 20 percent pay raise for teachers and, so, and school service personnel. Boom. Right, right across the board. I think it comes up to about $300 million a year. Um, I couldn't cheer them on harder. Um, as we all know, um, especially out in, in, you know, the eastern panhandle, um, you know, teacher pay, school service personnel pay is just, it, it's uncompetitive. That's all there is to it. If you're a qualified um, educator, um, are you going to teach in Berkeley County or are you going to cross the border into Virginia, Maryland, or Pennsylvania and make exorbitantly more money, right? Um, I think that, you know, lawmakers are, are starting to really understand the implication um, of not having competitive salaries um, for positions that are vital um, to the public interest and the services that, that West Virginians all rely on. Um, another bill that made it out of um, what's um, the House Jails and Prisons Committee would increase um, pay for corrections officers by $10,000 right across the board, bring starting pay up to around $43,000, and then um, offer a um, retention bonus, I think if it's five or $6,000 for um, for for guards who have been working three years or more, right? Um, Our Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation has, I think, I think the worst um, unfilled position crisis in the entire state. Like DHHR has 1,500 unfilled positions. That's bad. That's very bad. Um, But I'm pretty sure um, our our corrections facilities are like up in the thousands of unfilled positions. And the bottom line is the pay is just uncompetitive, right? And I think lawmakers are starting to come to grips and realize um, and I think that, that folks in communities are, you know, who, who, you know, see the problems with our, you know, regional jail crisis and see um, the problems when, like I said, when I was out in, in your neck of the woods, apparently um, there, there, there's a lot of, you know, full-time substitute teachers that have to be relied on to staff schools in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, and, you know, a lot of parents, I think, are getting a little fed up with that. So I, I would really encourage folks to pay attention to this dynamic, too, uh, because it tells me... Um, that, that there is pressure, um, that there is bottom up pressure from communities, right? So I think, you know, I don't think these lawmakers would just be running these bills, um, just for the sake of doing it. I think they're doing it because people are telling them that they're fed up, um, of their communities not having what they need, um, and they want to see changes and they want to see changes reflected, um, you know, through the value statement, um, that is the budget, right? Budget is a moral document. Um, what is it they say in the Bible? I'm not always really good at this. Uh, where a man puts his treasure, that there his you know, heart will be also something to that effect, right? You spend money on what you care about. Um, and I do see some momentum, um, especially within this last week, on addressing some critical problems uh, when it comes to um, competitive compensation for um, state employees. Um, and I think you're going to see some of the same movement towards PEIA as well. Um, PEIA is tricky with a flat budget, 
right? So if the governor insists on a flat budget, um, you know, a permanent solution for PEIA becomes a little bit more difficult. You can't really do premium increases with a flat budget because PEIA is an 80-20 match, you know, 80 to the employer, 20 to the um, employee, and the employer is the state of West Virginia. So even if we, so say, for instance, we wanted like a comprehensive fix for PEIA that involved maybe some dedicated revenue and maybe, you know, a modest premium increase. Um, um, that premium increase would act, have to be absorbed into the state budget. And with the, with the governor insisting on a flat budget, yet again, for the fifth year in a row, um, those type of permanent fixes become more difficult. But those are some of the things I would definitely encourage um, both, you know, you there in the studio um, and folks at home listening to, to pay attention to. So I, think it, I think it represents a very interesting shift, and I think that shift is being driven uh, by constituent pressure um, that is saying, we don't care about tax cuts that benefit the wealthy. We want to see our communities have what they need instead. So that's why I think these bills are starting to move. Seth DiStefano is our guest in our final couple of minutes with Seth. He is the Policy Outreach Director at the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. We had uh, certified public accountant Ken Apple in earlier this week to talk about the tax policies in West Virginia. Ken pointed out uh, probably three or four uh, interesting inconsistencies in the tax law that really could be fixed pretty easily, one of which is the marriage penalty. And he pointed out that a 50% personal income tax cut wouldn't fix the marriage penalty. It would just lessen the amount of money you get penalized, but still you're paying more as a married couple than if you were two individuals living together uh, in a similar income situation. When we didn't have surpluses, there was a pretty good movement about overall tax reform in West Virginia, and it seemed to have some momentum, fixing things like the marriage penalty, for instance, adjusting the top rate, which hasn't moved in the last 25 years or longer in West Virginia. Uh, at $60,000 is where the top rate kicks in. And I think these surpluses, Seth, have forced the West Virginia legislature's hand in the sense that instead of overall tax reform, it became about what's the best way of getting tax effectively refunds back in people's hands, tax cuts in, the, in that form, because we've got so much surplus. So we've, we've, I think we've lost the big picture about overall tax reform. Bill, you're shaking your head yes, sir. I agree, and I think it's because uh, now we're taking the, uh, uh, the politically expedient route we have the money. We're going to just, uh, uh, instead of taking the more difficult task of reform, we're just going to give a tax cut. Seth, final word is yours. So I think that, you know, and, and, and again, thank you so much for having me. I, I love the robust conversation in the back and forth. You know, I think that, you know, what we have here is, again, I'll, I'll use the term collision course. You've got four years of flat budget. Um, we have pent up needs all over West Virginia. Um, and, and, and the governor has put forth a fifth year of a flat budget. Um, on top of that, um, cutting one and a half billion dollars out of the general revenue fund. And so, you know, what I would say is that I think West Virginians right now are prioritizing the needs of their communities and their neighbors um, over over a tax cut that just overwhelmingly benefits the wealth. Um, and so that's that's what we're hearing, not just not just here in the insular bubble of you know Charleston, um, but definitely also out on the road as well. Um, and so there's, you know, there's six weeks left. Um, and I just I remember, I'd like to remind all the listeners, remember, you know, these lawmakers, the governor, these people work for you. And so um, don't be shy about, you know, reminding them of that and, and setting expectations as to, you know, the West Virginia you want to see created um, through policy and, and the West Virginia you want to see um, through the state budget. Seth, thank you very much for your time. As always, much appreciated. 